Well, it's good to see all of you. Um, if you are new here today for the first time, or today's your first Sunday, this is also my first Sunday and Annie's first Sunday for over three months. <laughs> so not that we're newcomers, but uh, it does. It feels familiar, but it's also like, oh yeah, we're back. Um, but thank you for uh, to our church uh, and, and our leadership and those who have been covering the pulpit during these last several months. Uh, we did. I did watch the the live or not live stream, meaning live, but because we were going to other churches. But you know, did watch them after as well, um, after the fact, and uh, was blessed by you know our services and and Steve preaching and of course Pastor Brian. But and we had some guest speakers as well. So thankful and getting to hear you guys worship and some of the testimonies too so we've been blessed but thank you guys for your prayers as well and covering during this time we really appreciate it hopefully we do seem like we're refreshed we don't know if that's a compliment or not like hey you gained weight or you know something like that <laughs> but uh um but yeah we are we are thankful for the time we had and we know it's not like a given that a pastor gets to have that time especially of smaller churches right too and so we are very thankful for that um but it's good to be back and to see you guys today. Uh, one of my sons asked me if I was a little bit nervous to be preaching again, and I do think that I feel out of shape, in a sense, you know, if you haven't worked out for a while, and then you do, because we've just been sitting in the pews and going to different churches. I've been kind of observing pastors where they sit, and haha, you have to preach today. No, not like, <laughs> not like that, but I, I kind of know what that, you know, they're going through, um, but I said, yeah, I think there is an element of that, um, because, you know, it's been a while, um, and so, I, you should feel that way to a certain degree, uh, but I don't want that to be because I'm afraid of man or because I'm thinking, oh, what are they going to think? But really, there should be a nervousness or there should be a sense of, am I sufficient for these things because I'm supposed to be sharing from the word of God? And so I do feel that nerve again. I do feel that weight, like, am I sufficient? Am I worthy to be sharing from his word? Um, but that just reminds us again, though, of how precious and powerful his word is is and it should be in our lives and so yeah i do come with fear and trembling because i want to have something to say but i also know that if i trust that i'm sharing from his word there will be something to say um, and so we are starting a new series actually this week and since we're back um, in second corinthians i know we went through another epistle uh, letter from paul uh, uh, not too long ago colossians which pastor brian and, and steve uh, covered very well but we're going to be reading this other letter from the Apostle Paul who wrote many letters in the New Testament. And by the number, you know that this is not his first letter to the Corinthians. We're actually reading the second Corinthians. And so you may be wondering, well, why don't we start with first? Well, we did that years ago, many, many years ago. And although he is writing to the same audience, even starting or, or going through second Corinthians, um, there's still a lot of things that we could glean from that without having read 1 Corinthians. But I do encourage you to read 1 Corinthians, and for that matter, I encourage you to read 2 Corinthians as we study through it for the next several, several weeks. Okay. Um, my wife also said that I might speak for an hour and a half because I've been gone so long. And so, you know, some of you know I can preach long. I don't know if that'll happen. I don't think so. Uh, so today, just to make sure that that doesn't happen, we're only covering two verses. We're only covering his greeting. But... Who knows? You know, who knows still? But all right, so we're in 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read uh, verses 1 and 2, Paul's greeting to them. Okay, so follow along with me, the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And I, I know as we read this greeting, and if some of us are familiar with New Testament letters, we may be like, yeah, that sounds just like all the other greetings or so many of them in these letters. Um, and while there is, you know, familiarity and letter, greetings were standard in letters back then as they are now, um, there is wonderful truths even in these few words. And as we look into the context of this letter and Paul's relationship with the Corinthians, there's also many important truths and powerful things to um, glean from it as well. And those will be unpacked as we go along. But ultimately, Lord, this is your word. It, yes, it's a letter, but it's what you chose to include in this canon of scripture so you could reveal more of yourself to us and teach us. 
And so, Lord, may we come once again with open hearts and hungry hearts to know more of your heart. And as we are in this section, Lord, we just want to be reminded of your gospel because Paul really knew and his heart was set free because of the gospel that he had received. And uh, may that be happening in our lives increasingly, we pray. So cover me, Lord. Um, yeah, apart from you, I can do nothing. I feel that a little bit more today, but we pray that your word will go forth as you promised. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it sounds like it's just a greeting, and it is in a sense, but it's very important. You know, we see here who Paul, who the writer is, who, who the author of this letter is. It, it's the Apostle Paul, and to whom he's writing, the, the church of God at Corinth, and other churches in that area, and also what binds them together, what connects them. It's that they have all experienced and received the grace of God through Jesus Christ in their lives. Okay. We'll also see, and I'll share some of that today, some of the things that are going on a little bit behind the scenes or some of the things that have happened in their relationship, Paul's relationship with the Corinthians. And there's a lot of tension, actually. So that helps us understand a little bit more as well of this letter in the context. Um, those of you who were here before we left, uh, I don't know if you remember, but one of the things I said that I wanted to pray for in my life, and we had talked about too in the series before we left, before I left um, on revival, and that was uh, the prayer of Moses, asking God to reveal more of his glory. Show me your glory. And, and Ruthie was also praying along those lines. Let's, Lord, we want to see more of your glory. And it's a very important prayer to pray. I was praying that during my sabbatical. Um, I don't know, you know, if I glow more, and, and I, I, I can confess to you that I didn't have like some amazing experience and God revealed himself per se in a certain way or maybe what I expected or were hoping for. Um, but it was important to pray and I'm glad that I prayed that. But you know, God is always different or he does things that we're not, uh, you know, we don't think of and we're not maybe even prepared for. But I realized that even with that request for God to show me his glory, we have to be careful because sometimes we could just want an experience. We just want God to give us some kind of experience. Uh, it's kind of like the person that maybe says, I don't really believe in God, but if God gives me a sign, if he does some kind of miracle or some mystical experience or something sensational, I'll believe him. I'll follow him. Now, you guys know that even when that happens, and we have evidence of that in scriptures, most people don't actually end up really following Christ for the long haul. They have that, and it's great, but most of them fall away. And we see that even in the Gospels of how when Jesus did miracles and did these amazing things, a lot of those crowds, they, they ended up falling, right? They, they didn't continue to follow him. And so we need to be careful of that, that we think an experience will just make us believe and follow God. But what I realized, or one of the ways that I guess God responded to me when I was praying, show me your glory, God, I want to see your glory, I want to experience more of you, one, I was reminded that, you know, he says to Moses, and we talked about this back in that series on revival, how when God does reveal himself to Moses, what does the scripture say? He calls all of his goodness to pass before him. He didn't give him an experience. He didn't do some mighty act. Well, look at this miracle. But he says, I'm going to reveal more of my character. I'm going to show you more of who I am. And so when we are even asking God for his glory, what we should be asking for is not some kind of experience or for him to zap us in some way, but rather for him to reveal more of his goodness, more of his nature to us. And what was interesting was about in the middle of my sabbatical, um, we went to church and uh, the pastor, who was not even their mean teaching pastor, uh, but he was uh, another pastor who was speaking that week, and uh, he said something during that sermon that just stuck with me. Um, and to preface it some. He was talking about um, what he says to his kids every night. Right? He has some young kids. But he says this to him, to, to them each night, something like this. He says, nothing bad you have done today will make God love you any less. And then he says, nothing good you have done will make God love you any more. He loves and accepts you because of what Christ has done so you can rest in his love. And that's fitting as they're about to go to sleep and rest. But he's reminding them of the gospel and how, what our standing before God is if we know Christ, if we have received the grace of Christ. Right? That there's nothing that we do in a given day, if it's bad or we're disobedient, 
that actually can cause God to love us any less because of what Christ has already done for us. And nothing good that we may do, if we have a good day, it's not going to cause him to love us any more either, like as if we could earn something more from him. Because Christ has already done that. And if we're trusting in Christ, we already have that. And so we can rest in his love. We can rest in his love. And I, I know that's very simple, and a father saying or a parent saying that to their kids, sounds like, but it's also deeply profound. And it's something that many of us, including many Christians, we still don't really get. And so I realized in my own life that it's hard for me to rest in his love. Um, it's something that I, I've realized, and maybe you've heard this term. Um, I'm recognizing I still have these, but we have these gospel deficiencies in our lives. We know the gospel. We've heard the gospel. We understand that, oh, it's because of Christ and what he has done and his work. But we don't know really how to do things like rest in his love. We don't know how to be secure in what he has done. And so, you know, even for me, one of the things about my sabbatical was like, did I do enough? And what if when people ask me, so what did you do for this last three plus months? You know, I, I have to have some, let me see, how many books did I read? I, I, and I'm going to tell them that, they're, you know, I told some, like I read this biography, it was like 800 pages. 800 pages, that's long, right? And I read another biography that was like 500. See, I'm boasting. <laughs> but what am I, it's about, I still felt like, oh, even though I'm resting and I'm Sabbathing, I still need to accomplish something, right? So did I read the word enough? Did I journal enough? I didn't open my computer, actually, until like six or seven weeks into the sabbatical. So I wasn't working in that sense. But, you know, did I pray enough? Did I read the Bible enough? Did I read enough books? Um, did I get enough insights so when I come back, I could, wow, he learned these things, right? Um, do I have enough vision now for the church? Guys, this is where we're going. I, I took three months off, and now God has spoken to me. And so there was this sense of pressure to that, I felt like. Did I do enough? Did I accomplish enough during this sabbatical, during this time of rest? Now, that doesn't mean, of course, I should have been lazy or anything, but I realized this deficiency in my life, too. That is hard. That even though I know the gospel, even though I, I want to say that I'm secure in what Christ has done and that's where it comes from, I still have a hard time truly getting this. I still have a hard time truly getting his grace, right? Because it is hard for me to just rest in his love. How about you? Now, if you're not a Christian or you're not sure, you should feel this more because you're going to be running the rat race. You're going to feel like it's your performance that justifies you. Oh, my accomplishments, my discipline, my this or that. And you're never going to feel restful. I mean, you may get like a weekend here, but you know how it is. You go on a vacation and you feel more tired even after the vacation, right? But mentally, especially, if you don't know the security that we get from Christ and Christ alone and his gospel, then it's it's you're not going to really find true rest. But even for Christians, even for believers, it's hard. It's hard to find rest because we're still trying to justify ourselves by what we do, how much we do, how much we get done. Parents, you guys know this about kids. And if you're just listening some, I, I don't know where they pick it up from. It's probably from you or probably from adults. But a lot of times, you know, when they get older and they're talking more, if you come home after work, um, what might they say to you? You know, after a little bit of just, you know, hey, you know, happy to see you, they might say, oh, mommy, daddy, you know what I did today? I did a handstand. Or, you know, I, I did this today or something like that. Like, basically, they want to share their accomplishments. Adult talk, it's similar, right? Again, like I said, when I talk to some of you after, you might say, so how, how was your sabbatical? What'd you do? And I'm like, man, what do I share? I have to have something to say. Like, I did this, this, and this. But we're always kind of proving ourselves in that way. Or we're always wanting to share some of the things that we accomplished. Okay? But the gospel allows us to be able to be secure in his love and say that we can rest in it. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this or this part is because Paul here, when he first he begins and he says that um, he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Okay? So as we look at Paul's life, what we see is that he was a man as an apostle um, of Christ, as one who had been saved by Christ, whose heart had been set free. And, and that's why we have that title for this sermon, the apostle of the heart set free. His heart had been set free by the gospel. Um, and so what did that look like? Well, you know, what we see from Paul, and even in this letter, we'll see that letter. First of all, he actually accomplished a lot for God's kingdom. I don't know if there's someone you know, outside of Christ that accomplished more for the kingdom of God and the spread of the gospel, all right? 
Um, so he had quite a resume, if you will. But you know, even later in this letter, what does Paul actually boast of? Well, one, he always says he boasts of Christ and Christ crucified. But even when he talks about his own life and what he's gone through, you know what he boasts of? His sufferings, his weaknesses. And uh, in 2 Corinthians verse, uh, uh, chapter 11, he actually lists all these things that he went through. You know, and they're nothing to boast of. Right? Not in a human sense, worldly sense. But that's what he shares. With all his accomplishments, he talks about his sufferings and his weaknesses. But his heart had been set free by the gospel, and so he didn't have to boast of his accomplishments. Even though he could have, he could have said, I planted this many churches. You know how many people heard the gospel through me? You know how many new believers there were? I'm sure he had an extensive resume if he wanted to share that. But he never went there, right? Because that's not where his security or his worth came from. And yet, he also worked very hard for the Lord. He poured out his life for Christ. So he was able to rest in his love, but he was also able to work, and he was compelled by the love of Christ to give himself and to do much for him. You know, one interesting thing to see even from Paul's life, uh, one quick example is, you guys know before Paul became um, a Christian and before he became an apostle, he was a zealous Pharisee, really religious guy, right? Pharisee of Pharisees, he actually called himself before. Um, he had studied under one of the most renowned Pharisees of that time. He knew the law. He was so zealous for it and for religion, um, and he persecuted Christians in his zeal. So he did a lot. He did a lot. So in, in his life before Christ, you could see this zeal. You could see this you know, energy and, and just, yeah, giving of himself um, for religion, right, for, for the law, et cetera. But then you see his zeal for Christ afterwards. And on one hand, you could say, well, maybe same personality, you know, same work ethic, et cetera. But something had really shifted. Something had changed. And I think it's kind of like this. I don't know if this is the best analogy, but, you know, if you think about maybe athlete, for example, um, they may uh, be very good at what they're doing, you know, on a professional scale. They may be accomplishing a lot. Um, but the thing that motivates them more is, uh, the people that are criticizing them or the people that don't believe in them. You know, Michael Jordan was pretty well known for that, right? If anyone kind of slighted him, he would, he would make up something in his own narrative so he could have this chip on his shoulder, right? So he could play better and, and he played like angry almost in some sense and it, it made him great. Okay. But, you know, a lot of athletes may do something like that. It's the criticism, it's the media, et cetera. But then you may hear some athletes who, who operate like that for a while, maybe something happens, they have this awakening, and they're like, I forgot about the love for the game. And then so, even though they're still operating at that high level, playing at that high level, they're not doing it because of naysayers or because they have something to prove to others, but simply they're reminded like, I really love this game. And there's this joy in them perhaps. There's this, you know, maybe they don't play as good to be honest, I don't know, but, but there's this joy, there's this freedom now in how they play because they're playing for the right reason or the, the reason that they first fell in love or, and started to play whatever game they're playing is for the love, not because of naysayers or proving themselves. To that. And so for Paul, that had happened. I mean, he thought he was serving God by being religious and by being zealous Pharisee, but he was doing out of duty. He was doing it to prove himself in some ways. But after he met Christ, he was then able to actually like rest and be secure in his love and not feel like that defines him. That gives him his worth. But he was also, in the midst of that, then compelled and motivated by a different reason. Not to prove himself, not you know, even out of duty, but he was compelled by the love of Christ, he says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay. So he, his heart had been set free, and this new relationship with God through Christ that set him free allowed him to rest in his love and to be compelled by his love, to pour out his life for the sake of Christ. That's how we know whether or not our hearts have been set free by the gospel. Okay. Is that true of you? Are you experiencing that more in your life? Now, I do want to give us a little bit of background to this letter, at least one aspect of it, because this is important to keep throughout this letter, this, this aspect. Um, it's Paul's most personal letter. Uh, out of his epistles, and Paul wrote many epistles, he wrote half over half of the New Testament, right? I, I forgot the number. Is it 14? I can't remember. Um, and 
as you know, too, that he wrote another letter to the Corinthians called 1 Corinthians. But there was actually more than two letters that he wrote to the Corinthians. There was a third letter. It's not in the New Testament, so we don't know what was written um, in any particular way. But it is mentioned in 2 Corinthians that he wrote another letter in between 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians. Okay. And so what happened? Um, well, there were relational tension that he was experienced with the Corinthian Christians, with the church in Corinth. Okay? Um, so getting back to like Paul's relationship with the Corinthians, or sharing that a little bit, Paul went there to Corinth in about 50 AD, maybe 49 AD, somewhere around there, and he spent a year and a half, two years there. Uh, there was T T Timothy and Silas was with him, also Priscilla and Aquila, but they spent time sharing the gospel, God was working, and they planted this church in Corinth. Okay? So that was around 50 AD, 51 AD. Um, and then after they left, about 53 AD, uh, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to them from Ephesus because he wanted to continue to encourage them and answer some of the questions they had about different types of things doctrinally and practically, and so he wrote 1 Corinthians to them to, uh, during that time, and he also wanted to address some of the things that he had heard about. Um, and he was planning to visit them shortly after that, but in the meanwhile, he sent Timothy, again, this is after he wrote 1 Corinthians, he sent Timothy to visit the church there to see what was going on. So during that visit, what Timothy saw was that there was trouble, there was issues. There was actually, it seemed like a growing apostasy because there were some false prophets, false, not false prophets, I'm sorry, false apostles or people that called themselves leaders who were going into that church and they were saying things that were wrong. They were teaching things, you know, that were off. And uh, they were also um, accusing and, and saying negative things about Paul and his apostleship, etc. And there was also some sin issues that remain. Uh, we can gather likely that there was still some cases or uh, instances of sexual immorality that was ongoing in the church that hadn't been addressed. Um, so when Paul gets this report from Timothy, he's, he's you know, his heart is weary, uh, not weary, but, but burdened. Um, he, he feels like, man, I need to go there immediately. And so he actually goes quickly to visit them. And he also knows that they're saying some things about him too. So he goes there and he visits. But the visit doesn't go as he had hoped it would. He thought that by him showing up and him meeting with them and their relationship from the past, that they would be able to address these things and they would smooth it out. But it actually made things worse. And the people then, some of the people then, they made harder or, or harsher accusations. They attacked Paul more during that time, that visit. And so Paul ends up leaving pretty quickly. Um, and he's wounded. He's discouraged. He's hurt. So he actually has to go away because it's just too painful. He calls it later in, in, in 2 Corinthians, his painful visit, right? Painful to him and to them. Um, he's not able to go back right away, I think, because of, you know, some of the things that he's feeling. So instead, what he does is he writes another letter to them. Now, this isn't 2 Corinthians. This is known as Paul's, quote, unquote, severe letter to the Corinthians, out of you know, what transpired from his visit and some of the things that they're continuing to do um, in rebellion, if you will, to God. And also, he calls them to repentance in that severe letter. He's doing it out of love, right? but he's calling them to repentance. And he sends this severe letter through Titus, one of his companions, and then he waits. And actually, Paul talks about that later in 2 Corinthians. Like He was waiting anxiously. He was waiting with this great burden, like, are they going to receive it? What are they going to say? Are they going to be angry? Are they and then finally, Titus shows up, and he tells them that most of them, they actually repented. But some of them and some of those false apostles are still there, and some of those things are continuing, and they, they still question and reject your authority. Right? And so it was after that he ends up writing this letter that we have. 2 Corinthians. So there's still a lot of tension going on. There's a lot of hurt feelings. There's a lot of things that have transpired. Okay? Now, what were some of the things that the Corinthians had questioned and even accused Paul of? Let me just give you this list quickly. But these were some of the things that they were saying about him. And again, remind you, he was the founding pastor, if you will. He had, you know, given himself. He had relationships with these people. He had loved them. 
and yet some of them were saying these things about him or questioning these things because, partly because of the influence of these other leaders. Well, one of the things that they're accusing or questioning about Paul is, man, are you even a genuine apostle, right? Like, are you really from God? So they question his authority. And one of the reasons they question his authority, and maybe this is helpful in our culture too, even with churches, not to say anyone who's a charismatic leader is, is false. I'm not saying that. But what they would compare it to is these super apostles. That's what they called them because they were so skilled in rhetoric. They were such good speakers, communicators, and they had a physical presence about them. And Paul, and, and you know, Paul, I mean, we don't know for sure. I mean, he writes well, but, you know, there's the incident of when he's preaching in a person's house one night, and it's late. Paul could go long. And one of the people actually fall out the window and die <laughs> because the sermon's too long. And then, and then, but he raises him to life. He raises him to life. Okay. Uh, but, and physically, Paul wasn't, you know, a presence, right, from what we can gather. And so they're saying, man, are you even really a legit apostle? You're not like any of these other guys that we're meeting, and they seem so much more, you know, put together and confident and able, and so why should we listen to you? Right? So that was one of the accusations they made in questions. They also questioned how Paul seemed to change his plans, including his travel plans, and so they said, man, you don't even keep your word. And what they're saying is, if God is really speaking you and leading you, and God gives you plans, then why do you keep changing them? It's kind of, it seems silly, but they were actually questioning that. They're like, you vacillate, Paul. You're, you know, you're wishy-washy. But he wasn't that. He was trying to be led by God's spirit. Um, another thing that they questioned was, if he really was God's servant, why did he suffer so much? Because, Paul, you just talk about your sufferings. And we should pause here because there are people, including within the church, who are like, well, one, on one hand, they may think, if I suffer, does God really love me? How can you say that God loves me if I'm suffering? And you may say, and actually my dad did this before uh, several years ago. Who, you know, he, he went to church, but he wasn't a believer at that time. And, um, but he would say, like, there is, like, a re respected pastor and a missionary that we knew, and they got cancer. They are really sick. And he was like, why does God let them get sick? They serve the Lord. Like, he was actually like, fine, I understand if I get sick. You know, I don't do anything for God, whatever. But these people actually serve the Lord and given themselves to the Lord. Why do they, these things happen to them? Why do they suffer that way, right? How can they be blessed by God? Right? So it's that kind of understanding. And so they were saying to, to about Paul, man, you, you suffer so much. All these bad things happen to you, and you're called by God. You're blessed by God. But Paul says that. And this is where we, one of the where, areas where we can biblically get a stronger understanding of the theology of suffering which the Bible does talk about a lot. And that, yeah, we don't earn something through our sufferings, but we do experience more of Christ's sufferings. We have fellowship with him. And there's something that works in us as a result and also to God's glory. It makes the gospel known too. Right? But they question like, well, why do you, Paul, why do you suffer in this way if you really are God's servant? And then this was the last kind of question or accusation. Why don't you receive offering, financial gift, for your ministry, you know, because these other speakers or these other leaders would come and then they would receive a, a gift, an offering for them. But Paul would refuse. He didn't refuse from all the churches he visited, but he refused to receive something from the Corinthians. And actually, instead, one of the things that he was talking about when it came to giving was he brought up with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, the first letter, about a collection for the church in Jerusalem because they were suffering greatly. The people were suffering there greatly. And so he asked them to contribute to a collection to give towards the brothers and sisters in the church of Jerusalem. But because Paul didn't receive anything from them for his work, they began to also accuse and even imply that, hey, you know that collection you said that you're collecting? You're not collecting it for them. You're using that for your own self. Like, you're, you're lining your pockets through that, Paul, right? So that's what they're beginning to say. Mind you, this was a church he loved, he helped establish, and they were saying these things about him now, okay? So this was some of the things that Paul was facing. So then, you know, we get to verse 2 in this greeting with some of those, that background. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Did he really mean it? <laughs> Did he really mean then grace to you guys, you, you ungrateful, you know, you guys are questioning everything about me, etc.? Yes, he did. He did. 
He did love the Corinthians, and not just the Corinthians. He also is writing to all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So one thing I, I admire about Paul is that even though it could have been very personal, it was a personal letter in the sense that his relationship with them had experienced a lot of these personal hurts, Paul doesn't get defensive personally. Paul doesn't make it personal. Okay? He knows that this letter is not just for them too. It's going to be read to other churches. So he wants to encourage and edify and build them up. So even the things he addresses, even though he's addressing some things that pertain to his relationship with the Corinthians, he's always looking for an opportunity to teach about broader doctrine, right? Bar broader truths about God's word. You know, when he's talking about the collection for the Jerusalem church, he uses that as an opportunity to teach on gospel generosity. You know, even in his struggles in ministry with them, he uses that to talk about what true gospel ministry is and that we have this ministry of reconciliation that we've been called to because we've been reconciled to God. Right? And then he talks about his weaknesses and sufferings, and he talks about what God teaches us through that as well. So he doesn't make it personal in that way. If this were just a personal letter, it would be really short. He would just say, you did this, you should repent, you, you, know, you need to further repent, I rebuke you, and that's it. But he doesn't do that. Why? Because he loves them and he wants them to continue to grow in the grace of God. Even if they've said some things that were mean and done some things against him. Okay? And so what does he say? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so though some of them discounted him, attacked him, and doubted him, he wanted them to grow. He wanted them to grow in grace. He wanted them to know more of the peace of God in their lives. Real brief, I think most of you guys know this, but, you know, even if you share with others, or if you share with others, I think it's important. We should distinguish here between the peace of God and peace with God. And what that means is you can't have the peace of God if you don't first have peace with God. You know, I've met some people real quick. Sure, I remember uh, one of our outreaches, there was a man who, you know, he was physically gotten sick a few times, and he actually ended up passing away a couple months later. But, um, you know, in my conversations with him, you could tell that there was this desire to have peace with others, like his relationships with maybe family, a strange family, and uh, just to have more peace in his life. And one of the things that happened as I was having some of these conversations is I felt like God was leading me to, well, that's good, and I want you to have that. I, I believe God wants you to have that, but you first have to have peace with God. You can't experience the peace of God in your heart. And, you know, sometimes we just want relief. We just want to feel better. But you need to first truly have peace with God. And that's only through Christ and making yourself right with Christ through, you know, repenting of our sins and being convicted of our condition as a sinner and then receiving the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Then we have peace with God. And then because we have this peace with God through Christ, then we can experience more of the peace of God including our relationships. There's forgiveness. There's, there's ways for God to work. But if you try to do that the other way, it doesn't work. If you don't have the peace, if you don't have peace with God, you can't really have and experience the peace of God in your life, in your relationships. But Paul is talking here to mainly Christians. He's talking to the church in Corinth, and he's saying grace and peace to you. He wants them to have more of the peace of God. Okay. So what I want to end with is just how do we know if your heart has been set free by the gospel. How do you know that? Or what are some ways that you can know that? Based on, you know, Paul's example and how he responds to a lot of negatives in his life and still remains faithful. So it's in that context. But I want us to examine or ask ourselves three questions. Okay? One is this, in terms of examining whether our hearts have truly been set free or they're continuing to grow in the gospel. Do you trust, the first one is, do you trust and endure in God's sovereign and revealed will in your life? Do you trust and endure in God's sovereign and revealed will in your life? Paul says, and it's not a throwaway line, but he says in verse 1, he's, that he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. What is he saying? No, you may think that there are more, you know, apostles or, or quote-unquote apostles and leaders who are, uh, look and talk better than I and seem, you know, greater than me, but I am a true apostle. I may not be super, but I am a true apostle because I've been called by the will of God. So he's not saying it's based on my ability or my giftings or because I say so, but it's because God has called me. 
And remember, Paul's testimony was such that he did have a pretty amazing conversion experience, right? When God blinded him on the way to Damascus as he was seeking to persecute and imprison uh, Christians, God revealed himself, Jesus revealed himself, and then he, you know, he was saved, but he also called him and said, you're going to serve me, you're going to do many things for me, but you're also going to suffer much, right? So he, he told him that. But, but Paul received that from him. And so I think what Paul is doing here when he says that he's an apostle uh, of Christ Jesus by the will of God, he is reminding the Corinthians who are doubting his authority that it's, I'm standing on his authority, not my own. Not because I'm just saying like, hey, you better listen to me. But no, because God has called me. He has made me an apostle. And he's reminding himself as well that I need to continue to endure as an apostle, including in a situation like this where these people are, you know, negative towards me or, you know, hating me or just saying these things about me. And, and ministry is hard. He's reminding himself as well of God's call, his revealed will in his life. So Paul's reminding himself that, yeah, I have this high calling. It's from God. I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. But I also need strength, especially when it's hard, especially when forces are against me or people are against me. I need to remind myself that I've been called by God. I'm an apostle by the will of God. It's not all roses and easy, right? I, I need to be reminded of that. Um, and because he knows this deeply, because his heart has been set free by the gospel, he's able to endure. He's able to persevere and continue. Now, I know none of us here are called as an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm not either. I'm called as a pastor, but <laughs> that's nothing compared to Paul's calling. But uh, we need to be reminded of that, not just in you know ministry role, but in other areas of our lives too. So as Christian, as a follower of Christ, we may not know God's sovereign will in every area of our lives or in our future, but he has revealed things to us already. We know what his revealed will is. So for example, in holiness and sanctification, right? First Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about how this is the will of God for your life, your sanctification. And then Paul talks there about the importance of, you know, fighting against sexual immorality, right? Your desires. That's not the only fleshly sin, but he talks about that. So when it comes to our holiness and our sanctification, look, you may have had a bad week. You may have struggled with your flesh and sin in some ways. You know, and, and that may be ongoing at certain times, but you're reminded, no, I need to continue in God's will for my life. This is what he has revealed, and I need to endure in this because he has called me to this. He has called me to holiness. So I may fail. I may have failed, but I can continue to move forward as I trust in him because he's doing this, and he's called me to this, right? So we endure. In, in marriage, for example, as a husband or wife, Look, you may think at some times, and hopefully no one here, but why did I marry that person? Okay. Well, if you're married to that person, that's God's revealed will for your life. Okay? That is. You, it, I know our culture, divorce happens, and you know, the Bible talks about divorce only in the context of mainly of, of adultery. But if you think like, oh, man, I can't endure, I can't persevere through that. No, that's not his will for your life. It is to continue. And so we're reminded of that. And our hearts have been set free enough where it's not like, oh, my marriage is the basis of my happiness or my spouse is my idol and they're not doing what I want them to do, so I want to get out of it. No, we've already received that from God in the gospel. And so we're able to endure, including when marriage is hard. This is his will, and I will continue to endure. And I will trust that God will continue to work in the midst of this. Okay? Um, as a parent, same thing. You know, especially if you have young kids, you're tired, you're like, oh, but... This is God's will for your life right now. And you endure. And your heart is set free in that, in the gospel, even though you may be physically tired, that, well, God has his purposes in this, and he's called me to this, and I could continue in that. Right? In the church, hopefully that's not true in our church as much, but it's definitely true of a lot of Christians and other churches. People don't stay in churches. People are far too casual about their commitment to a church because they think, like, oh, I could just switch or change whenever I want. Right? But... The way that God has revealed himself and his commitment to us, we should endure. I mean, there may be some reasons why a person could leave, you know, church, but just in general, our commitment to him should, should uh, show or reflect his commitment to us, including to his body. Okay? Um, so there are examples like that, but are you trusting and enduring in his sovereign and revealed will in your life? If you are, increasingly, 
you know that your heart has been set free by the gospel. Uh, another question to, to help us examine. Do you keep loving people, especially his saints, out of the overflow of his, of his continual and enduring love for you? When God's grace sets us free, we don't do relationships based on accounting, based on, well, what they did. And so we see this in Paul. Right? He was hurt. They attacked him. And, and again, he had given himself and poured out his life for this church for a period of time. And he prayed for them, and he wrote letters to them, and he showed his affection for them. And yet they doubted and questioned things. But Paul didn't close his heart after that. You notice that? And I know in our lives, and I've been there, after we've loved and maybe done so repeatedly and we try to have been patient with people and then something happens and we kind of want to say, well, okay, now I'm going to close you off. You know, Three, four, five times is enough, right? But Paul doesn't do that. Um, Rosaria Butterfield, who's an author and some of you guys know her, she, says, she has a couple of phrases that I appreciate. One is you know, we have to learn to hate our sin without hating ourselves. Right, which is important as Christians. That's how we grow. Like, we got to hate our sin, but we don't hate ourselves. But another little phrase that I like that she says is, we don't throw people away. And this is hard, I mean, to me, because I've been in a place where I just want to, hey, let them go, right, too. Okay. Of course, there has to be a willingness on the other person's part, too. But when we have received God's enduring love in our lives and his gospel, his love through the gospel, then we are willing to continue to love those right around us, right? We're continuing to love out of the overflow of his continual love for us. And notice how Paul addresses the, the church in Corinth. Again, this, you can miss this because you just think, oh, okay, that's just what he's saying. But he says this, to the church of God that is at Corinth. You guys follow that? He didn't say to the church at Corinth or to the Corinthian church, but he says, you guys are the church of God who happened to be in Corinth. So he is reminding himself as well of the fact that they are God's people, even though they are flaky, even though they rebel, even though they say negative things about him, they are God's people. They belong to him. And so he continues to love them because he knows who they belong to out of the outflow of God's love for him and that he's experienced. And so Paul is encouraging them and loving them even in spite of their resistance to him. Perhaps. But he's also saying to them, God has saved you. God has called you his own. Now become more of who God has already saved you to be, right? And so he's encouraging them in this way. You can continue to grow. I'm not giving up on you because I know God doesn't give up on you. Right? And that's another sign that the gospel has set us free. We're able to keep loving, including when it's hard to love people, out of the overflow of his love for us because he's shown that to us. And then the, the last question is this then. Do you know how to rest in his love and work for his glory? Do you know how to rest in his love and work for his glory? Okay. So we've already talked about resting in his love, and that's important. And that comes from knowing that, yes, if you, you know, we talk about the gospel a lot here, but that you've been justified before God and accepted before God based on what Christ has done. He takes our sins. He gives us his righteousness. It is Christ's work in our lives. That's how we can stand before God as judge, or if you want to use the imagery of a court of law, how we can be considered innocent or, um, you know, or, yeah, just approved by God. It's because of what Christ has done for us. Okay? So that's how we're justified, based on what Christ has done. We need to get this so we can rest in his love, so we don't think that we're going to earn more by what we do or less of his love by what we do wrong. But we also, when we get this and we're secure in this, we are free then to work for his glory. We're not just resting and like, okay, good, God's got me, so I'm just going to you know, do nothing now. But actually, we're more motivated and for the right reasons to work for his glory. We're compelled by him. We're not doing it out of duty or doing it to prove ourselves. We're doing it out as a response of what he's done. We're compelled by the love of Christ for us, and so we work for his glory. Um, you know, during this sabbatical, I'll, I'll be honest, there was part of me that said, yeah, a little over three months, which is a long time, and I'm very thankful. But I was like, I could do another month. Um, 
that's okay. Uh, yeah, um, that'll be okay. And I never brought it up, of course. <laughs> but in my mind, I was entertaining that. Um, but I was reminded that as good as rest is, was that I wasn't, we weren't made for rest. Understand that? You know, before the fall, when God created man and woman, what did he create them to do? To, to work, to work the earth. That was pre-sin, right? So if we think that heaven's going to be like we're just going to sit around and lounge around all the time, I don't think we're going to work. It's going to be good work. We're going to enjoy the work, but that's what we were built for. Okay? So there's nothing wrong if you desire to work and you feel like that. That doesn't make you like, you know, greedy or like whatever, you know, ambitious. And stuff. That's part of our makeup. We were created to work. But we have to get that order right, and that is, you know, sometimes in our culture, people may be like, yeah, I work Monday through Friday so I could rest or have fun and recreate on the weekend. So it's basically kind of like a perverted way of seeing it like, I work so that I could rest. No, that's not the model either, right? What it, the biblical model is what God intended is that we rest well in him. We're secure in him because, again, we have that security through what Christ has done, right? And because we have that, then we're able to work well for him. For his glory. Okay? And so I'm thankful for the rest that I had in spite of, but I was reminded that I'm not meant to rest. I'm meant to work for him, for his glory. But if I can't rest well in his love and find security in that, then my work is also going to be a little messed up, a little bit wrong to the motivation. It's, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do either. Right? So we have to learn to truly rest in his love. And as a result of that, if we are, we're able to work for his glory. And we're getting the reasons right. We're getting the motivation right. We're having a peace in our heart. We're not affected when we work and things don't go our way or if we're not as successful as we want to be because we're already resting and we're secure in Christ's love for us. But we're also free to give of ourselves radically and to do maybe things we wouldn't have done because we're not so afraid of what that's going to affect, like what people are going to think of us or how that's going to affect, you know, my own identity because our identity is already in Christ. So if you're getting the gospel more, which I still need to get, you're able to rest in his love and work hard and fully and pour yourself out for his glory. Okay? But that's what it looks like. Those are some things that it looks like when our heart is set free by the gospel. So has this been happening in your lives? Are some of these things true in your lives? You may know the gospel. You may see you believe in Jesus, but it can still go deeper. We still have deficiencies in our lives. And these are some ways to help us see where those deficiencies might be and to trust them more. Let's pray. We're going to have communion, and um, as you can see, and you know, it's an it's a opportunity to respond and to be nourished and to be reminded of what Christ has done, what he has accomplished, um, and how you know, we need to be rooted, and, and you know, the basis of who we are and what we're worth is first and foremost found in what Christ has done for us, right? So we're reminded of that. But then we're also filled then, too, as we come to the table, I pray. And we're empowered, we're strengthened, we're encouraged then to be able to give of ourselves because we have this rest, we have this certainty through Christ and the gospel. And then we're able to then work for his glory. We're able to do things because we're compelled by his love. Okay? So we're reminded of that even in this picture of communion today. And so I just want to want us to take a moment before um, we enter into communion and we come up um, to be reminded of the gospel and how that has set us free. And if there are still areas of our lives right now where we're stuck or we're feeling that there's these deficiencies in our heart, asking God to reveal these things more to us, these truths of the gospel all the more to us. Okay? So take some time to do that. And then um, as you are led, I would ask you guys to come up um, to take the elements. And again, this is only for those who profess to be Christians. If you're not or you don't profess to be, um, please don't come up and don't feel any you know, strain or anything like that. You could just sit and observe and, and maybe pray, ask God to continue to reveal himself in your life. But uh, for those of you who are and you know, you're willing to come before him and repent of any sins as well too, then come forth and, and partake of the table and then go back to your seats. Or I, I'm sorry, Pick up the element and then go back to your seats and then we'll take uh, the elements together, okay? So don't do that until we do that together, okay? So let's come before him, let's pray, and then uh, come forward, please. Mm -hmm.